Welcome back to the Make Time for Success podcast. This is episode number 93. Are you struggling to feel a sense of purpose in the work that you do? Or do you feel that there may be more that you could derive from your relationship with your work? My wonderful guest today, Dr. Nyla Bari, is here to describe the many options that you have for developing a better relationship with your work and with yourself as a result. This area of our relationship with our work is most certainly Nyla's zone of genius, and I can't wait to share her and her genius work with you. Dr. Nyla Bari is a sought-after leadership and career coach and teacher, helping humans do their greatest work in the world. Nyla brings a research-based, heart-led approach to her practice of helping professionals create a healthier, more meaningful experience of work. She believes we can all design careers and lives that delight us. She teaches at Columbia University and co-hosts the podcast, Inside Job. Let's go listen to my conversation with Dr. Nyla Bari now. Hi, I'm Dr. Christine Lee, and I'm a psychologist and a procrastination coach. I've helped thousands of people move past procrastination and overwhelm so they could begin working to their potential. In this podcast, you're going to learn powerful strategies for getting your mind, body, and energy to work together so that you can focus on what's really important and accomplish the goals you want to achieve. When you start living within your full power, you're going to see how being productive can be easy and how you can create success on demand. Welcome to the Make Time for Success podcast. Hello, dear listener. It's Dr. Christine Lee. Today, I'm very, very pleased to have my new friend and colleague, Dr. Nyla Bari on the show. We met just a few weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago, And we were at a conference hosted by the beautiful and wonderful Pamela Slim, also a guest on this show. And we were at a conference to explore different avenues and methods to deepen our network and our zone of operations for our businesses. And I had the good fortune of sitting right next to Nyla and immediately falling in love with her and feeling connected with her. So Nyla, thank you for being on the show. I'm so excited to be here and I'm so excited to spend more time with you. So thank you for having me. Yes. Thank you for being here. I know that your specialty is really working with individuals and organizations around improving the work experience. Could you describe for us in more detail what you do and how this became your area of specialty? Sure, sure. So I mean, when I think about the work I do, I sometimes say, I am a person who is obsessed with how we experience work. I am a person who cannot stop thinking and wanting to take a look at and investigate and improve the way that we relate to work. And a stat that I share with a lot of people is that most of us, most Americans, it should be said, will work 90,000 hours in their lifetime. And that is an enormous number. And for some people, I say that number and I see like their jaws kind of fall and maybe I can even witness their heart sink a little bit because it just feels like, oh my God, that's so much of my life. And it is. I mean, it is more conscious time than we will spend in any other single activity, more time than we'll spend with our kids or our partners or in our most favorite hobbies. And again, this is most of us will spend most of our life doing this. So my point of view on it is I can either be overwhelmed and disappointed and just tearful around that, or I can think of it as an opportunity to decide how I want to work and what I want to do and who I want to do with. And that's the kind of work I like to engage with people. Like if we're going to work and most of us are, then how do we do in a way that feels deeply aligned with who we need to be at this moment in time, who we aspire to be, that delivers excellence to whatever we're doing and lets us set our heads down at night, believing we're having impact in the world. Um, So that's the question I think about. How do we do that? And the way I do it is I teach in the classroom. I coach. I spend most of my time coaching with people one-on-one. I do some group coaching. And I also host a podcast where I get to talk about this with my colleague, Eric Johnson. And that's been a great adventure of our own. That's what I do. I really want to spend 
my professional life and a lot of my outside of professional life exploring this question, how do we make the most of this activity that we spend the majority of our time doing? Beautiful. A very worthwhile pursuit, I should say. Your podcast is lovely as well. It's called the Inside Job Podcast, right? Yes. Thank you. I appreciate that you listen to it. That yes. means a lot to me. Thank you. Yes. Yes. I love your voice. I love your content. And I love the questions that you pose. I think you're really curious about what makes certain things run in a certain way and what are the struggles that people have on a day-to-day basis, what's getting in people's way. Can I ask, was there a specific moment or an event in your life that caused you to focus in this direction? Yeah, oh, I actually love that you're answering this because it's been a while, or asking this because it's been a while since I've explored this. Yeah, there, I would say there was like a convergence of a couple of factors. One is that I was a very long suffering doctoral student at Columbia University. I'd been in a doctoral program in adult learning and leadership for more than 10 years. And I had been doing it while I worked full time. And I had at the time two younger children. I mean, I still have two children, but they're older now. And I was really trying to wrap my head around that final phase, collecting data, constructing a study to write the dissertation. And I had bumped into a a number of barriers. And my advisor was like, Nyla, you got to get done. Like, we got to finish this off. And she said, you know, who do you have a lot of access to? And I said, you know, MBAs. I've been working in MBA education for, at that time, probably 15 years. And I said, I have lots of access to either current MBAs or former MBAs, like people who went to business school for a particular purpose. So people who are trying to accelerate their careers, like that's what this population really has. And she's like, let's just study those, like figure out something. And so I put the pause on that. I had been working at Columbia Business School for most of my adult life, working with full-time MBAs, helping them sort out their experience at the business school from an academic perspective, from a financial perspective, from a community and social perspective, from a mental health perspective, doing all that stuff. And I would have seen over the years, so many people get exactly what they wanted from an MBA and so many people not get what they wanted. They didn't get the dream job. The marriages fell apart. Parents fell ill. Students fell ill. You know, you come into an MBA program thinking like this is the launching pad for awesomeness. Like everything's going to be amazing. And then for a lot of people, real life happens. You know, you don't get the internship or you have the internship, it doesn't turn into a full-time offer or you get out of business school with this amazing job you're so delighted by. And two years later, you're kind of walking back in the building saying it didn't work out. Like either I didn't perform as well as I thought I would, or we had restructuring and I didn't survive the cuts. And I would watch all these students come back and try to overcome these disappointments. And I had always been interested in helping them through that. So what's happening is that I'm trying to finish school. I'm witnessing this pattern in my student body and I'm facing a pretty big birthday at the time. And I was like, I got to figure out who I want to be in the second half of my professional life. So all of those things led me to create a study around layoff. How did people emerge from the experience of layoff? I was doing qualitative research, so having these long form interviews with people. And it was happening at a time where I was wondering for myself, what am I going to do professionally? So all of this kind of came to a moment where I spent a few months really seeped in these stories of work interruptions and work trauma. And I thought, God, the thing that I notice is that people who look at this experience as part of a relationship with work, rather than being identified exclusively, like I am my job, I am my career, I'm broken because my career path is broken. The people who were able to look at it from the outside were having different kinds of results. And I wanted to like understand those people. I wanted to be like those people. And that became kind of the body of work that's inspired how I think about our relationship with work. How do we take practices and take time to separate ourselves from our jobs, our identity from what we do for a living. And that is like the material that developed my practice, my thinking, my writing, the podcast, like all that stuff shows up because I had that convergence of my research, witnessing my students over all these years and my own personal career evolution take place. That's such a beautiful explanation of a very complicated set of things happening in your life. I'm so glad that it worked out and that you've built this beautiful career around that time and what you were observing. One of my responses is to talk about time, which is the subject that I'm obsessed about, and reflect that a lot of the people that come to me looking for help 
are expressing that they don't have time. They feel like they don't have the time. And oftentimes it's because of the work that they're involved in, that the work takes morning to night and there are no free moments or they're not experiencing their time as theirs to use. Could you say some words about that? And if you see that too? Yeah. I mean, first of all, I I know that experience like in a painful way. I have definitely had the sense that like time, which I experience, I guess, in some ways through the activities I participate in, which are like partnering and mothering in my home life and working, which is what I spend a lot of my time doing and other activities that I do, right? Friendship and my book club and my reading habits and cooking in my kitchen. I have often had the experience that I was like in competition with myself, that like various domains of life were competing for Nyla's attention. I know I'm not alone. I mean, I think that's why you have, you have a business and a practice and so many people who lean on you. And I think it's something I see all of my clients struggle with in some domain because I sometimes say, and I, again, my domain is work. And I think about you and I've had this conversation before, like the point of entry for me into a coaching relationship is work. It is the platform from which we begin to engage exploration and insight and action planning to get something different. What I find is that most of the time it doesn't end with work. We also are like, while we're in here, while we're like surgically exploring the things I believe must be true that make me work too much or resent my job or see myself too deeply and intertwined with my job, can we take a look at like why I never go to the doctor? Can we take a look at why I say it's important for me to you know travel to go see my sister, but I never do? I imagine it's the same for you. Like the, you went, you enter through thinking about time. And then you kind of looking under the hood and then you're like, oh, while we're here. Yes. You know, but the, to your original point, like what are my comments on how people experience time through work? I sometimes say like work can be like water. Like it just seeps into every possible crevice and crack, finds every vulnerability in the system. And I have a lot of my clients who feel like they don't manage their time well because they don't feel satisfied by their output. They're busy, but they sometimes wonder like, what do I have to show for it? You know, I know I responded to a lot of email and perhaps I updated a deck or I wrote a report, but at the end of the day, do I truly believe I had impact in the way that's mine to have? No. And I think one of the things we start to unpack is what we value, what we really think about the potential of our impact in the work that we do and what we're willing to say no to in order to do what's sometimes the harder work. Like it's very satisfying in some regards. Like I'm sitting looking at a pile of crap. There's no other word for it on my desk, right? Like bills I got to pay and emails I got to send back, a form I've got to send to my banker, like stuff that's like, it's important. It keeps the wheels in motion, but it's not the kind of work where I close my eyes at night and think like, God, that was a great day. Like, wow. <laughs> like, thank God I did that today. <laughs> but, you know, if we're not careful, that's like, that's water. It's going to seep into every crack and it's also going to consume all my mental energy. So this is one of the big questions I see my clients struggling with around time, which is like, where do I spend it? Do I, my, do I feel appreciation and gratitude for how I've spent it? Do I feel the results are worth it? Do I look back on a quarter or a year or five years and think like, wow, I really moved the needle. And I think what can be very disheartening for us is when we feel like hours of our lives are gone and we're not really sure if we did something that was special that we should have been doing. Do you find that people have difficulty stepping into the role of observer of their own life? I think- Totally. I love okay. that. I love the use of that expression. Because I think we enter the work world as recent graduates and recent survivors of formal education. Also love that language. And- <laughs> We're in a more passive role and we haven't yet set our identity in the workspace. So I guess we're in many ways vulnerable to the first workplace that we find ourselves in. And I think there is that structure also, whether it be corporate or educational or nonprofit, that there is a structure that we have to find a place in, but that can make us also feel like we're subject to the structure rather than a participating active agent with power. And 
maybe some of us are also used to that passive role from childhood also that maybe we weren't given the room to really reflect, to really give voice to what we're thinking and our opinions. And that all comes to a head at the first job. So I would love to hear your thoughts on these. I mean, topics. there's lots like a gold mine. There's like a dozen things you said in there that could probably each be an episode of a podcast, yours or mine. I think the nerve you struck when you offered that is that I do believe deeply and painfully that we learn habits around productivity and measurement early, both through school and through early jobs that have us learn to value our time well early. I think that's the way I would say it. And I just, you know, we opened our kind of pre, before we started recording, talking about the college process, which I'm just about done identifying where my first child's heading to college and you have two kids in college. So we've just gone through this kind of milestone for our older teenagers. And I think it's like the beginning of the end when it comes to seeing ourselves as precious in a way, because what ends up happening is that the achievement timer has been set loud and clear for my kid. Like she knows like the race is about to begin. I mean, you've been in like the training laps for the last couple of years, but now it really begins. And I think this is the thing that I find myself unlearning with my clients over and over again is this like measurement of our productivity by how fast we move, how focused we are. Right. I think in a way this is where focus has a dark edge because Sure, it makes us get a lot of things done, but I wonder if we do lose the habit of observing ourselves at work because we're in it. We're so busy get, trying to get it done that we're not paying attention to like, is this actually working for me? Do I really want this? Am I actually doing a great job that feels aligned with who I am? Or am I just performing and producing because someone set a standard for me? It's kind of a mess in there in the beginning because I think there's such a race to achieve. And time feels maybe endless early on. And it feels like I'm measured by how many hours I pour in and how much they get out of me. And it's not just, you know, your first job. And I, you know, my first job was at one of these big law firms. So it's like, it's a too classic an example where, you know, we're paid hourly, we're paid over time. There's glory. I mean, glory in having to work through dinner. Like it was like, if you, I remember this guy, it was so long ago now, but if you were on the floor, on the paralegal floor and it was clear that you were ordering dinner because you were going to be staying for several more hours. Like high five to you. Like you've done something right because you're working longer, not only harder, you're working longer than others. And that means that you are important. You're doing a good job. It means you're being recognized and seen. And I think when we are exposed early on to that kind of metric, it like creates appetite for more and more and more. I have to work really hard and really long hours and be super, you know, and I'm, I can't stop at use air quotes around the word productive. And I don't even know if it feels productive from an internal measurement point of view. I think in those points of our career, we're waiting for someone else to tell us we're doing a good job. And I think that what I see happen with my clients is they've never stopped looking to the outside to be told you're doing a good job. And what ends up hurting is when they are 20 years into career, which I would say most of my clients are, they're like, wait a second, like, I still feel like I'm running on this treadmill, but I don't know who set the pace. It wasn't me. Someone else set the pace 20 years ago and I'm tired. And it's not just like physical fatigue. It's like existential soul fatigue. I am not doing what I'm supposed to do. So I am tired and they want a reset. And that's when someone like me comes in. And could you describe <laughs> succinctly, perhaps podcast in a bite-sized way, what principles you teach to help people to make that bridge from the treadmill way of working to a more engaged and fulfilling way of working? I mean, I would say, I'm hoping that that comment about podcast size is not a comment of my verbosity, but it might be. No, like, it's, not at all. it's not it's at okay. all. <laughs> I, can, I have a lot of words. My husband <laughs> likes to tell me, and I leave a lot of words. I usually start with this very simple question, what do you want? And I find that most people need a minute if not several months to answer that question. That's the simplest thing I can offer is, is when you feel pain on the inside, like an ache around work, you know, the Monday morning blues, the Sunday night blues, do you come home and eat a bag of Cheetos because you just can't handle it anymore? That might just be me. <laughs> the simplest thing I can say is what do you want? And I'm shocked by how many people really struggle to name what they want. 
Yeah. Thank you for that. My comment was not about your verbosity. It was <laughs> out of respect for what I believe is got to be really deep, ongoing work that there are layers to be peeled back, there are exploratory questions to be created and then answered. And that whole back and forth process of let's get the courage to look at this because it's unattended. We've been working too hard and we haven't been looking at what has been missing or needed so that you feel well. I'm going to comment on the productivity air quotes because I think I am someone who really is very pro productivity because my specialty is working with people who haven't been able to produce to potential or to their own standards. And so for me, I transferred my style of being from procrastination to, I think, healthy, vibrant productivity where what I do immediately feeds my soul, where I feel joy when I cross something off, when I submit something, when I publish something. And I think I don't mean it to be toxic to anyone, but I do think it is an avenue by which people can find real joy and real satisfaction. But I would imagine that's not true for everyone, that maybe some people need peace, they need escape, they need a change of job, they need a reduction of their workload, a significant reduction of their workload and stress. Yeah. You know, the thing I, I want to respond to that you said, you said something like, you want to help them be productive in their own style. And that's what caught my attention because I think that's what connects what you do with what I do. It's like finding the self again, the agency, the autonomy, the self-directedness in our own careers and lives. And I wonder, you know, something I'll be, I'd love to know from you is like when you've done what we've done, which is got on our own and created our own way of sharing the work that we do in the world, we get a lot of my own, right? A lot of like, this is what I like to say yes to. This is what I don't want to say yes to. This is how I define productive for myself. These are the days where I'm willing to drill in and give it eight or 10 hours. These are the days where I'm telling myself it's a three hour cap. What's the most important thing to get done today? How do you guide people to thinking about classic productivity in a place where they don't have as much independence or agency, where it's something like, you know, a job in an organization? or you are in someone's team and they're setting the pace? That's a great question. I think my style of teaching is very much overlapping with yours. We go to values. You know, what are your values? What makes you happy? And to make sure you're getting that at some point during the day, whether it's at work or at home, in the morning routine or in just the breathing or the relaxation that you might be able to get in between job projects, and also just really a respect for actual time, clock time, because I think people who lean towards using procrastination a little too much tend to have an overflow of emotions and emotional stress and anxiety in the productivity space. So I like to help people tease out what is a fear story that they're telling themselves about that they're afraid of the work. So that that's one of the things that we have to address head on because it's not great to be afraid of your own work, to be afraid of judgment, to be afraid of the deadline, to be afraid of the frustration of having to work and concentrate and focus. And once we clear that away, it tends to be the work and how much time will it take. So it's relatively clear in comparison to the procrastination entanglement of time, worry, running out of time, increased worry, decreased self-care, and then lowered self-esteem. That's a bad bubble to be in. And I try to help people see that it's not an everlasting state. It's not part of your character. It's not even a habit that needs to be kept. It's just easily changeable. So that's my strategy. I love that. I love that. Also, you said something about like the difference between real time and what I guess I'll call like perceived time. Like one of the things that shows up for me a lot with clients who want to think about having a healthier relationship with work is this perception that they don't have work-life balance or integration, whatever the, you know, pick your, your language around that, but that work dominates, right? And 
I'm often curious with people, like, is it real that there are things that matter to you when we look at your values or we look at, you know, we use this tool, the wheel of life to help you identify the other domains of your life that are important. Is it real that you don't have time for them or that you perceive you don't have time for them? Because those are not always the same thing. And that's really interesting to me. Also, I, you know, you know that I have a daughter with ADHD and one of the things that characterizes her ADHD is this thing called, they call time blindness. It's kind of a defect in her executive function where she, you know, she can sit and work. She does art, so she can sit and work and her body doesn't have the natural mechanisms to know, like I've been sitting here for about half an hour or I've been sitting here for two and a half hours. Her ability to discern that is just not available. Yep. Um, and so we have, we really had to think about in our house, we worked with a tutor years ago on this, like seeing time, like putting analog clocks around and making lists and strategies and tactics to say, okay, I'm doing this for 20 minutes. I'm doing this for 40 minutes. We've all done it, even though technically she's the only one who suffers from time blindness. But wow, is it different to realize how time actually passes versus how we feel about time passing, right? If we're doing a task that we are afraid of, or we don't like, versus something we really do like. Something that I use for myself, and I don't necessarily have other people do, is that I just say to myself, because I tend to be a slower paced worker, that I just need to 3x my pace. And that helps. That doesn't always bring stress. Sometimes it might cause a little bit of stress, but generally it just saves me gobs of time that I can use in more fun ways if I'm not having to like the work that I'm doing. I just know like I can just push the speed, get more productivity per time period, and then feel like I've got freedom the rest of the day. So there are lots of different things that we can do. And it really is individual. I love that. Based, right? Your daughter's going to have different things than I have. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I also just, I think that's it's lovely. It's just a, another connection between what you do and what I do, which is like, I think clients probably come to you as they do to me saying, just, can you just tell me what to do? And you know, there's, I'm like, uh, it depends. Like there's probably, I'm going to offer you a set of ideas, a set of good questions, a set of tools, and you're going to have to select the ones, try things out, be willing to fail. And you'll end up designing a suite of support systems and tools and ideas that work for you. And I'm sure that's true in, in what you do too. It's like, I wish I could say like, take this quiz and follow this recipe. And it's super easy. The good news, I think, is that when people feel stuck and they feel like there's some emptiness or something that's a barrier, it's quite easy to get the positive energy and the positive feelings to come in again. I think that's what they're yeah. craving. Yeah. Uh, I think that's what that's my theory, that we all are craving a good feeling and especially about our work, something that we care about and spend so much time in and something that is so associated with our identity, oftentimes our adult identity. It's, it's so important. So yeah, our work is definitely overlapping. I have another question and that is around the water concept of work because with COVID's entry into our lives and consciousness, uh, one article that I read that I thought was really hitting the nail on the head described how everything changed. But the thing that we were forced to accept was that work was now in our homes. And I'm wondering if your work was affected by that and what you've observed kind of on a broader basis in your clients. Yeah. I mean, certainly my work has been impacted. Like I, you know, I've in the last prior, prior to launching my own business, I worked in an organization where I worked from home a couple of days a week. So I'd had some experience working out of my home, but not like this. Certainly, I'm aware that if I'm not tending to myself, I will be on my laptop all the time. You know, I'll I'll take a break to cook dinner, hang out with my kids a little bit. But if we're if they're doing homework or we're watching TV, like I'll notice suddenly my laptop's in front of me. Like how'd that happen? It just all of a sudden I'm like dealing with stuff, and every single one of my clients is dealing with it. And I don't know anyone who I think didn't translate their commuting hours into being more working hours. I'm not sure I know the person who was like, actually, instead of commuting, I went to the gym for an additional hour. Like, I don't, I don't know that person. I think in the beginning, it felt like a way of survival. It masked and gave us somewhere to put our, all of our, our anxiety. Like, I'm just going to work because that way I don't think about how the world seems to be on fire. And I think expectations rose organizationally from managers 
from teams that like, well, you're home, so I should be able to reach you. Like, I can't be that hard to get you to just log on for five minutes, right? So I don't know anyone who's not been impacted by this. I think when we start thinking about the solutions, I think about how do we create boundaries that are less porous? And most of that comes through activity and habits. I don't know if that's something we think our way through. I think it's something we do. You know, and for me, it might mean my home office, it happens to be in our basement. So there are many days where I just don't take the laptop upstairs. I just don't do it. And I have to tell you, I feel the pang. Like I feel the like, oh my God, I'm letting something go. And I just have to like experience that feeling and look at it and be like, "Mm, I don't have to believe that just because I'm having that thought. Um, But for a lot of my clients, it's that kind of stuff. Like what can we do this week to replace the time that you might spend doing an extra hour, hour and a half with work with something else that satisfies a different appetite. So that might be time with the kids. It might be a walk with a neighbor. It might be going to the gym or reading a book for that matter. But I think it's easier when we aren't just telling ourselves what we can't have, which is that hour with the laptop, but what we get to have instead. And I guess that goes to your point about feel like we're chasing the good, right? We're seeking the good as Rick Hansen would say, which I believe in very much. So I like to say to my clients, not just what won't you do, but what will you do that will put some balance, some integration back into your day, some boundary around these laptops of ours. I love this. So thank you for being (laughs) the heart of working. I think you really see work for the powerful zone that it represents in each of our lives, but also you really respect the self who is trying to make their way through that zone so it's not painful, so that it's not a struggle, and so that it's meaningful. I think you do beautiful work. I think you articulate your beliefs and your curiosity so beautifully so that people are affected. And so thank you, thank you, thank you for your work. I mean, that's so generous. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate your work so much. And I'm so excited to see what the future brings to our partnership. Yes, me too. So look out world. Uh, We are coming. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Nyla, please let us know how our listeners can stay in touch with you and potentially work with you. Beautiful. Uh, My website is just my name, nylabari.com. That's N-A-Y-L-A-B-A-H-R-I.com. I'm really active on LinkedIn. So that's where you can get the best sense of how I think, as well as my podcast, which I co-host again with my friend and partner, Eric Johnson. It's called Inside Job, the podcast. We're all over the place. We're really active on Instagram and on LinkedIn. We'd love to hear from people. So thank you for giving us that opportunity. Yeah. Please share your thoughts about this episode and Nyla's work with a DM to Nyla on Instagram. That would be fantastic. Please share this episode with your friends and your colleagues if you loved it too. I would love that as well. Thank you, Nyla, so much for your time and your work. And listeners, thank you for your time too. I appreciate you being here and your giving the time to the Make Time for Success podcast. Have a great week. I'll see you next Thursday. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Make Time for Success podcast. If you enjoyed what you've heard, You can subscribe to make sure you get notified of upcoming episodes. You can also visit our website, maketimeforsuccesspodcast.com for past episodes, show notes, and all the resources we mentioned on the show. Feel free to connect with me over on Instagram too. You can find me there under the name Procrastination Coach. Send me a DM and let me know what your thoughts are about the episodes you've been listening to. And let me know any topics that you might like me to talk about on the show. I'd love to hear all about how you're making time for success. Talk to you soon.